Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome <laughs> 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 um, to the first presentation of the Primetime BU Library 2013-14 season. I'm Keith Brooks, I'm part of the Faculty Development Team. Primetime is a collaborative project between the Friends of the BU Library, Faculty Development, and many other offices on campus. Celebrating learning beyond the classroom through the experiences and accomplishments of the faculty, the students, and staff. Prime time schedule is filling in. If you'd like to see what's coming up, check out the homepage of the new library website where our events will be listed. <coughs> our next presentation will be this Thursday, September 19th at 1020 again. Uh, Sam Mulberry and Dr. Chris Garrett will present a field report from the Digital Frontier online CWC. Today we're kicking off our season in an epic way. We have uh, Dr. Jay Rasmussen and his son, Connor Rasmussen. Uh, motorcycle and all here uh, to share about the epic journey to Argentina. So definitely glad to uh, be honored to introduce Jay in our San Education Department and Connor had to be my introduction to liberal arts class. So it's like a family affair. It's like a family reunion. All right, let's welcome Jay and Connor. Well, thanks everybody for coming. I hope this is a, a good break in your day. You can kind of forget about everything else going on and uh, join us on a 12,000 mile trip that was uh, about 70 days or so. And I think honestly both of us wish it was 140 days or you know, maybe an entire year. Uh, we, we've struggled with being back. We're back a month and a half now. I think we both wish we were on the road still. But, uh, but thanks for being here and I hope you, hope you enjoy it. Um, Again. First of all, can anybody spot my spelling error? This is like really embarrassing for a professor. I have one in my first slide here. <laughs> the D. The D. There's no D in it. <laughs> Heaven thought of, so. Yeah, so we've got an error there already. Just a little bit of background about the trip. Uh, like I told you, it's about 12,000 miles. We originally thought it was going to be 10,000, and it wound up being 12,000, and probably 2,000 accounted for being lost multiple times <laughs> and, and, and taking all kinds of side journeys and everything else. But uh, it, uh, for us, it was really a trip of a lifetime, and for me to be able to do it with my son was a really, a really special thing as well, too. The whole genesis of the trip came from a, a documentary series that we watched. Doesn't that seem appropriate for a professor? But so we watched this documentary series called The Long Way, The Long Way Around. It's a five-hour series, Netflix. It's about two guys that decide they want to take motor motorcycles from Europe actually through Siberia and then completely around the world, circumventing the world. And uh, we watched this uh, five-hour series about halfway through. We're starting to look at each other thinking, this looks pretty cool. Uh, we, we kind of like uh, Latin American countries. Maybe we do a long way down instead of a long way around. So that was the, the genesis of the idea. Uh, just to introduce myself, there's people here I don't know. A lot of people I do know. I'm a prof in the ed department, and by nature, I'm a, I'm a traveler. I'm an adventurer. When I was in college, I remember, I remember this day, I think I was about 20 years old or so, not knowing what I wanted to do with my life in college. I went and did a, a Strong Campbell interest inventory to find out what I should do in life, and it told me I should be an adventurer. <laughs> I, I thought, great, how do you make a living doing this kind of thing? But uh, I also, like kids, wound up going into the field of education, and it was a perfect fit for me, because every summer I could take off and go someplace and explore. And uh, Bethel's been a fabulous place, too. They supported me as I take off on all these various adventures. Uh, pretty much every time there's a break, I'm, I'm heading off someplace. Uh, this is a shot of me at Antigua. Uh, those of you who have been there before probably recognize some of the, some of the background of it. And, uh, like I said, a prop in, uh, a prop in the ed department. 18 years at Bethel now, and it's been a great place for me. So I'm the son part of the father-son duo. Um, I'm Connor, I'm 20. I'm two weeks into my college education so far. Um, I took a year off last year, lived in Kansas City. Um, and just because he's the world traveler, our family kind of became world travelers too. Um, we spent time in Norway, and my whole family was really, really enjoys traveling a lot, so this trip and this opportunity was just fantastic to grow um, in so many ways, I think, and it was awesome to do it like that as well. Well, the other, the other part of the equation here is not just us, but it's our motorcycles. I mean, you literally get where you feel like you are one with your motorcycle after 12,000 miles. 
Um, this is actually Connor's bike up here. It's the same year as my bike. Uh, we wanted them the same year, same models, just because of repair purposes. If you learn one bike, you can kind of fix the other one. If you have to carry spare parts, you've got the parts that fit both bikes, that type of thing. These look like really big, expensive bikes. Um, they actually are pretty inexpensive. It's a Kawasaki KLR650. It's what our military uses. Uh, it's what's called a dual, a dual sport bike. So it's, it's pretty comfortable on the road, yet it's comfortable doing some off-road type things. We bought both bikes, each bike for about $3,000, bought them used, and then we did a bunch of modifications. So we added, uh, added panniers, lockable aluminum panniers where we stored most of our stuff. And then this is a PVC bag right here. We kind of turn it this way so it's aerodynamic. Your back rests up against it. And then uh, we had a tank bag. Uh, everything that we needed actually fit in all this. At night when we'd come in a place, we would just grab this bag, walk in, and uh, lock up our panniers and we were good to go. So we tried to, tried to travel really light. Um, so we added panniers to it. We put a different seat on them that's more comfortable. We put a higher windshield that works better. We've lowered the fender so it doesn't catch so much wind. We put an extra fork brace in here to stabilize the whole front. Put heated grips on because we were in some pretty, pretty cool temperatures. Uh, put crash bars on. We dropped our bikes probably combined seven, eight, nine times on the trip. Crash bars, it's got a, a metal skid plate down here. Put highway pegs on that you can only use in the United States. You don't use those any other place. Um, I think those are kind of basic modifications for it. So we took a, a smaller trip uh, to the Magic State Park about two years, a year or two before we went on the trip. Um, and this was just to gain some skills in off-roading. More so, we didn't really know the type of terrain that we would be on. Um, so we just wanted to prepare for everything. So this was kind of the typical thing. This, this path is actually bigger than most of what was there. But that was really a challenge. I probably put my bike down like six times in 30 minutes, which is really embarrassing. And it's really heavy and hard to get up and all that stuff. But it was really, it came in handy later on on the trip um, when we were doing more off-roading stuff, as you'll see later. Very humbling. And being a humble motorcycle rider is important. Otherwise, you're a dead motorcycle. You've got <laughs> dead motorcyclists. You've got to you got to know what you can do. We took our big tune-up trip before we went to Argentina. It was a trip out west. Uh, we went um, went through Glacier, kind of entering Glacier here through the North Cascades, and then to Seattle, and then we kind of gunned it back from there. But we wanted to get some significant uh, travel experience. The deal with the motorcycle is that you need to get to the point of where everything you do is just instinctive, where you don't have to think about it. And the only way to get to that point is spending a lot of time on a bike. So before we left, um, we put on probably 10, 11,000 miles before we ever left on the trip, just getting to the point of where we're really comfortable. Because especially when you're in Central America, South America, you've got to be watching everything going on around you and you've got to just react and think. You can't have to think about, I'm going to do this next or do that next. So there's no, there's no shortcut. You just have to get really, really comfortable with what you're doing. So this is all our gear that we brought on the trip. Um, we had to plan for temperatures between, I think we planned like 15 degrees to about 105 degrees. Um, so that's just a lot of clothes. We brought uh, backup parts. You can see the cans there is just different things for the bike. Maintenance is really important on this trip. Um, most people who fail doing something like this don't keep up with their oil um, or their lubes and stuff like that, and their bike tends to break down. Um, so we wanted to make that really important um, and focused in on that. So this is our ping pong table in our house. We got everything on there, so it's good. This was one of the models we had for the trip. We kind of changed our models as the trip unfolded, but uh, I got the shirt on here. I think kind of, I, I got you know, dirty. You know, I do one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's dirty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so really what our intent was here was to focus on each day and have each day be the best that we could possibly make it. And so often on long trips you keep thinking about the end, the end, the end. We wanted to focus on each day and just immerse ourselves in culture as much as we could. The reason for the motorcycle is that it's a wonderful way to stay in contact with people that are around you, with the scenery that's around you. You literally see everything that's going on. You have to to stay alive. You smell everything that's going on all the weather that's there, you feel all the weather, and people talk to you like you would not believe, especially once you get out of the United States. Anytime you stop for gas, 
anytime we were in cities at a stoplight or whatever, other motorcyclists, cars would roll their windows down, they're starting to talk to us. So it was repeated conversations pretty much every place, you know, every place we went. Um, we tried to stay in places that were really inexpensive. I don't think we ever spent more than 20 bucks a night once we got outside of the U.S. So we're, we're staying in people's houses, we were staying in hostels, um, I don't know, we were just staying in any place that was cheap basically, and where kind of normal people would go. Everything we ate was inexpensive as well. We ate a lot of street food. We both went through a little bit of sickness for maybe a week or so, and then after that, we were in, in pretty good shape. So, so we tried to, as much as we could, just immerse ourselves in, in the culture and with people that were there. Um, it is 70 days to go through as many countries as we did. It's really an overview, you know, for sure. But um, it helped us really see some places that we want to go back and spend some additional time as well, too. So this is the first leg of the trip on um, the U.S. journey. We started in Minnesota um, and then worked our way through Iowa to Kansas, Emporia, Kansas, um, which is about 600 miles, which is a really long day on a motorcycle. And then we made our way um, to Texas, and then I have an uncle um, who lives in Austin, and then we spent the night um, in Laredo and just wanted to get as far into Mexico as we could the next morning. We left on May 21st, and um, Actually, I skipped out of Bethel a little bit early, but May 21st we left, and we needed to meet a boat in outside of Panama City on, Ju on June 13th. So we had roughly three weeks to get to that boat. That boat leaves once a month, and if we're not there, we're in big trouble. So the first, this whole first part to Panama, we moved pretty fast, and then we started to slow down a little bit after that as well, too. We, we started off the trip with a couple other guys. Um, this is Connor and I. At the start, we were carrying an extra set of tires just because the tires we needed were a little bit tricky to get. Connor's got double bags back here, but uh, this is my brother-in-law, this big old Harley. Um, this is a nephew, his first long motorcycle trip. So they wanted to go until they hit the edge of civilization. I'm serious, this is what they called it. Uh, when they rode with us to the Mexican border, they would not go over the border. They turned around and crossed back. And it still drives me crazy, because they have all these images of Mexico in their head. And if I could have gotten them into the country, I think it would have really kind of busted a lot of their thoughts. But anyhow, it was great to have them have a ride with us. Uh, this is what you normally think of as a big touring bike. This bike actually is better for a trip to Argentina than typically than the big, big Harleys. Um, this was outside of Moore, Oklahoma, right after the really, really bad tornadoes. This was about three days after. Um, and it was just really incredible. I'd never seen anything like that. You could see litter um, maybe 15 miles before you actually got to the epicenter of the tornado. And that's kind of what we started noticing. And then you just saw a line of just destruction going through maybe a mile or two miles wide. And it was just absolutely incredible to be there. And you could just really feel the impact like on the people there and on um, just kind of the situation that was there. I'm going to jump you pretty fast through some things here. We spent the night um, right in Laredo. My preference is to cross Mexican borders early in the morning and honestly to kind of get as far as you can. So, so we crossed the border pretty quick here. We went to San Luis Potosí, which is a beautiful, beautiful colonial city here. Then from there in Mexico, we went to Guadalajara. And um, for years, we've, um, I've led a J-term trip there. So we have a lot of friends in Guadalajara. So we made a pretty major detour to spend some time in Guadalajara. Then we came down into the state of Michoacan, you know, which is right in here. Pretty famous for a lot of cartel activity, La Familia and so forth. But a city called the Huarapan. And then uh, a place called Valle de Bravo, which is a little bit west of Mexico City. Beautiful area, pine trees, lakes, you know, just gorgeous. And then down to Oaxaca, which has got to be one of my favorite cities and then uh, San Cristobal, and then we crossed over into, into Guatemala. So that was the route. Because we are going in the summer, a lot of our route planning involves staying at elevation, just so it's not terribly hot. So quite a bit of the time here, we're at elevations of six to 7,000 feet. Here we're going through pine trees by lakes, just stuff that people don't think of connected with Mexico. Um, so that was the basic route through Mexico. So this is what, um, San Luis Potosí, um, and this is a very typical, uh, I guess, central area. Um, most larger towns have a central area where people um, kind of gather, um, which is something I really, really like about Latin America specifically. 
Um, it's just a really solid place in the community. This was one of our favorites. Um, it's an example of Colonial um, City, Mexico. There was a lot of silver mining, if I remember correctly, um, that was here. So this was a very industrial place for a long time. This was the family that we stayed with in Guadalajara. Uh, they look really American. Believe it or not, they're kind of more Mexican than they are American. They've been in Guadalajara for about 30 years right now. The kids grew up there. Uh, we stayed with them. Glenn is the director of the school that we worked with in Guadalajara. Austin here actually taught at the school for a year or two, which is really cool. We've had, I think we've had probably eight or nine Bethel students that have gone to teach in Guadalajara. And I'm trying to think if there's any still there. There are a number of them that were there like five, six, seven years a wonderful couple. Um, what we wanted to do as well, just kind of as a token and as a memory, um, is added stickers for every country that we went into. You can see on the pan you're here, um, some, and then the rest of the countries on the other side. Um, but it was really important for us just to check something off every time we got to a place. And really, yes, we got here. We made it this far, and we can keep going. Um, kind of giving hope to us, I guess, for one of the days that long. Sometimes if there was a person in that country that we really connected with, we would often give them the honor of putting, putting the flag on. So that was fun. We've got a lot of shots of different people important to us sticking, sticking flags on as well. This was, uh, we're in Guadalajara still. <clears throat> this guy's name is Jorge. Uh, he's actually the PE teacher at the school. Austin knows him. Really cool guy. He played on the Mexican Olympic basketball team. Amazing guy. But he's also president of the Christian Motorcycle Association for the whole country of Mexico. And um, he's actually a pretty good friend of ours. He wanted to ride with us uh, you know, for part of our journey through Mexico. So we said, great, come. And uh, here he is, um, kind of, they pray for the motorcyclists. They pray, pray for the motorcycles as well. And that's, that's what's going on here. Just a, just a phenomenal guy. So this is, um, after we rode with Jorge, we came to this natural forest. Um, this is kind of one of the more popular ones in all of Mexico. And it's just really kind of breaking the norm, I guess, of what people expect of Mexico, of like deserts and all of that stuff. And it's just super lush green area. And we spent probably five hours in there just exploring. Um, saw some really cool animals. And there's a lot of runners in there, which I was really surprised by, I guess. But. This is a shot outside Oaxaca, kind of this photo. Probably one of my favorite favorite <coughs> photos of the trip. Uh, a tricky place to get to. It took us probably three hours to get here, and it basically involved going up dirt roads, rock roads. Not quite sure where we are, where is this we're going. But um, this was, um, these are actually boiling kind of hot spring type areas. And then going off the whole back side of this is really petrified rock of all different colors and so forth. It was just, we were, Pretty surprised when we got there. We knew it'd be a cool place, but it was just a just an amazing spot. This is um, later on in Oaxaca. This was in the central area, and there's um, in the background the people sitting down there playing live music. Um, and it seemed like a lot of the town was really gathered around and just dancing and hanging out um, with each other. So this was a really special night for me just to see the community that would happen in that town. I guess, and I really really enjoyed that. I think Oaxaca is maybe my favorite city in all of Mexico, and I've traveled quite a bit other parts of Mexico. And the thing I most like about it is the indigenous influences that are there. And when you walk the streets of Oaxaca, you'll hear Spanish, but you'll hear many, many native languages you know, going on around you. Uh, the food, obviously, is really pretty unique in, in Oaxaca as well. Uh, just amazing history. You can get to a beach you know, if you want to. But if you ever have a chance to go to Oaxaca, I would just jump on it. Uh, you can fly into Mexico City, and then in about three hours, you're in Oaxaca. A very cheap place to stay, and absolutely gorgeous. Just a, just a neat city. Um, our route through Central America then <clears throat> took, us, took us into Guatemala, and then um, really just kind of one day in El Salvador, one day in Honduras, a couple days in Nicaragua. Um, some time in, um, in Costa Rica, we had some friends there, and then uh, down into Panama, and then this is, this is where we took a boat then, and the boat went from here basically over to Cartagena, Mexico, or Cartagena, Colombia. Um, there is no way to get through this area. This is called the Darien Gap right here, and this is an area about 60 miles wide that is impassable. There are no roads, it's all jungle. It's controlled by narco-traficantes and extremely dangerous. So you either fly around the gap 
or you take a boat, okay, one option or the other. We decided to go on a boat. We'll show you that in a second. It was kind of a floating youth hostel. It's kind of what the boat was. <laughs> it was. It was a cool experience. <clears throat> And then just to add to the gap, um, that kind of became another one of my dreams to go through that area, which I'm guessing he won't join along. No, with that <laughs> no part of that one. You kind of go there to hide, and then just it doesn't usually end well for people. Um, <laughs> this was in um, this was in Guatemala in Lake Atitlan um, area. There was another nature reserve that had some fantastic coffee. Um, that was some of the best coffee actually that we had. Which I like coffee. Good stuff. Um, so this is little monkey dude. He's just hanging out, um, enjoying life, and we enjoyed him. So, yeah. Border crossings are really interesting with motorcycles. Um, border crossings without a motorcycle or without a vehicle are pretty easy in Central America. You know, you show your passport, and you, you pretty much just walk across the border. Anytime you cross the border with a vehicle, it's a whole different story because your vehicle is worth a lot of money in that country. Here we bought these for $3,000. they are worth about 7000 in most of the countries that we were, you know, that we were in. So anytime you go into the country, you are literally importing and exporting a vehicle every single border that you cross. And you never know what you're going to encounter. It can take anywhere from three hours to five hours. There's nobody that ever tells you where to go or what to do next. And there's little buildings and little huts and little people you know, that are different places. And you just try to navigate it. Um, at these borders, especially Guatemala, not this border, but there's what they call fixers. And these are people that will help you, supposedly help you get your motorcycle across. Um, they're there to make money. Um, and some of them do help you. Some of them will try to scam you. Um, we chose to not use fixers just because our Spanish was good enough to get us through anyhow. But it was an experience. This was, this was actually coming into Nicaragua. Uh, this, was a, this was a guy that was helping us with all our import and export papers. Uh, he took a liking to us for some reason invited us in where it was air conditioned and uh, just a cool guy and uh, was came to have his picture taken which most mm -hmm. most borders they're not not too too interested in having that take place also in this picture there's a lot of our paperwork um, down on the table that you saw we probably carried a stack a folder about this wide um, with titles um, passport copies uh, just a variety of everything you could possibly imagine and then if we didn't have that paperwork then we were just really in trouble so we needed to over prepare and over plan um, just to even get in the country, I guess. In every country you come into, you have to buy insurance for that country as well, too. So typically it's not much money, but it's like one more step. One country we thought we didn't need to buy insurance in, we found out we needed it, we wound up getting stopped by the police. It was our one stop in the whole trip, basically. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, we, don't, we didn't have our insurance papers. It was in Peru, and we wound up paying a bribe, kind of, is what we did there. Other than that, we didn't get a single traffic ticket. We were not in any accidents. We didn't have any major breakdowns. And we found police and other people to be just really helpful on the trip. It was very different than what a lot of people think is, is going to happen. It doesn't mean bad stuff doesn't happen, because I can point to a lot of people where it does. But our experience was really was really positive. This is in um, Nicaragua. This is a place called Sova Negra, um, which is a, a German eco farm. Um, this is possibly the largest eco plantation in all of Latin America. The guy was contending for that, if and he's sure about Central America. Um, we love this place. This is my bike actually broke down, parking. Um, I parked in the wrong spot, so I was moving it, and then it just died on me, and it went to start up again. So we spent a little bit longer time there than we thought we would, and it was just some stuff in the carburetor. So it was five minutes to clean it. Um, I really enjoyed it, though. I had a an organic hamburger. That was the best thing I've ever eaten in my life. It's so just phenomenal. We, in Nicaragua, we went down to Granada, and there were some missionaries that we knew there. We spent some time with them. And they were working with a lot of kids there, and actually a lot of women in particular, uh, making handicraft things that, uh, from a, it's kind of a big nut type thing. You can see the kid holding it called a hikaro. And uh, they make some beautiful jewelry out of it, and bowls, and cups, and pots, and everything else. And it was, uh, we stayed in their dorms there, and fortunately we had a fan, so it was okay. But uh, just a, a really a really cool place. Connor's interested maybe at some point going back to doing some work there. They're really doing a lot of community work, I guess, too. Um, they're really transforming the neighborhood. And it was, they tried to find the roughest neighborhood possible um, in Nicaragua, and then they've been slowly changing that. Um, so that's been really cool to see. This is um, a friend of the family named Rodrigo. Um, my mom knew him. She was involved in campus ministries at the University of Minnesota. 
um, and then he had gone there to do some um, postgraduate, right? yeah, postgraduate work. Um, he works, I guess, primarily with soils, um, and this is soil consultant. And so he was showing us around coffee trees um, and kind of telling us really good coffee, and this is a coffee plant, um, and kind of what that means and when you can harvest it and all that. So I'm very intrigued in this. It's my favorite current. <laughs> This is outside of, um, basically outside of San Jose. They lived in a place called Al Alaweha. And uh, this is uh, uh, Vul Vulcan Poas is the name of it. Very active as you can see. This is um, coming outside of Panama City. We had met up with some other motorcyclists who were going to meet the boat um, with us. So um, it was a couple. So it was a, a guy who was driving the motorcycle then is um, okay. fiance was on the back of it, and then she was taking pictures of us. This is one of the few pictures of us together. Um, usually he would take a picture of kind of me or whatever else was going on. Um, one of our least favorite cities, we found it really Americanized um, and very, it was just real rough. We got really lost, which was kind of scary there. Um, but So this is one of our, our only pictures of us riding together, so we really hope for this one. The whole trip we decided to not use any GPS. And we did it for a couple of reasons. One, it was like, really cheap. And the other is you have to buy different packages for many of the different countries. It's not like the US, you buy one package and it covers everything. But the main reason was we really wanted to understand the geography of where we're going. And looking at paper maps really helps it kind of set in your mind a little bit. And we also, believe it or not, wanted to talk to people about where we're going. And it helps if you can, some people make sense of maps, some don't. But it really helped a lot just to, to have to ask people, where are we and where are we going? And any city like this, for example, we would routinely stop eight to 10 times, you know, trying to figure out where places were. Most of, most of the countries we're in, you wouldn't, there wouldn't be street signs, or there often wouldn't, usually weren't numbers on houses, so you have to kind of ask where this is and where that is. Several times we were literally in front of the building we wanted, and we didn't know it, even though we were still there. It'd take us three hours to get there. But, uh, it's just a, that's a major challenge, trying to, you, you know this if you've traveled there before, but uh, finding where you're going is, is really something. This is, um, this is the boat that we traveled on. Um, remember I told you it was this floating hostel. Um, this boat was built in 1902. Um, it was built originally as a Norwegian fishing vessel. So I thought that sounded good. It's got to be tough if it can last in Norway. It's been retrofitted a couple times, and it operates as a nonprofit, uh, basically hostel. You know, is what it is. Um, it it has a lot of character. And, uh, it was it was interesting. Just getting there, we had to go from is about probably two hours to get from Panama City to where we boarded this boat. Uh, it was through some really heavy duty jungle. We had to go up this one road where there was a guy that was riding with us and he had trouble getting up the road because his front wheel was lifting up on his motorcycle all the time. But the only way he could get up the road was to cut crosswise like this, going up, you know, winding his way up the road. So just to get to this boat, you know, felt like a major accomplishment in some way. This is our captain, um, is a, um, a German guy's name is Ludwig. Um, he was really sick for a lot of the trip, so we didn't really see him that much. Um, you'll see a picture of him later, which is possibly my favorite picture of this little slideshow. Um, really smart guy. He'd actually been involved um, on fishing vessels and on this type of thing since he was at the age of 15. Um, so he is full-time, really an expert, I guess. So I was, I was really confident and happy with him. Ludwig service to us. You gotta trust a German named Ludwig, right? <laughs> you're on a boat called the Stallrat, which in, in English means the steel rat. So that, that was our boat, the steel rat. That's what we were on. When they when they put the cycles on, um, they winch them up and uh, it's pretty scary watching, honestly it is. This is Connor's bike going up. He's watching them tie everything on. They're, they actually start to lift it up, but they completely forgot to tie the whole back rope on his bike. And he pointed it out, fortunately, so he got the rope tied on. <laughs> yes, it is. So to winch him up on. Um, the first night that we spent um, on the boat was actually in Acuna Village, which is an indigenous group um, that is only living on islands right outside of Colombia. Um, and this is just an example. They were really gracious enough to offer us a couple of their houses um, for the travelers on the boat so that we could spend the night there and also cook for us is really good food. Um, it's some fantastic bread. And um, Stalrat really 
tries to buy most of the food for the trip um, from the clean people as a way to support them. Um, and we spent probably a day and a half just kind of exploring the village. And it was a really compact island, so we got to know it really well and kind of met some really fantastic people there, too. This is a shot from the island, and, and the Kuna people um, make their living off tourism to some degree. People visit their islands for sure. But they also have coconut plantations. And there's hundreds and hundreds of islands there, and they planted coconut trees on all of these islands. And then um, it's they are major exporters of coconuts, primarily to Colombia. So they make their living off exporting coconuts, and then fishing, and then tourism. And, uh, it, was, it was a really interesting experience. Um, this is about day three into the, the Star Ride adventure, which was about five days, and he spent one of those days extremely sick and the other one extremely sunburned. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is in the San Blas Islands. We anchored there, there's the Star Ride, and did a lot of snorkeling um, for a day, and then we actually had a bonfire on this beach, and it was just stars like I've never seen were in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Some ocean I don't remember right now, which is embarrassing, but we're in the middle of an ocean, and it is just fantastic. Just yeah, there. Um, just seeing that, I guess, was just like me. We met some interesting people on, I call it the rat, it's kind of what we call it. But when we were on the rat, there were people that were motorcyclists, there were about five of them or so, and then there were some backpackers that were there. We took an affinity to the motorcyclists because they got bored at first. And this was one guy we met, he's still on the road right now. When we met him, he had been on the road two and a half years. And um, he's a, uh, I think a top-notch photographer. I absolutely love the work that he does. He travels with a tent, and basically it's called bush camping or wild camping. He just, he just like finds some place to put his tent where he never has to pay any money. He's trained himself to live on a thousand calories or less, so he doesn't spend much money on food, and he goes really slow when he, you know, when he travels. He just now got out of Colombia. Uh, he just exited the country about three, four days ago. He's in Ecuador now. No idea how long he's going to spend there, but you know, he's. I suspect he'll probably be going three, four years in playing. We keep up with him on a pretty regular basis, and uh, just a really, really cool guy we met. This is another guy that we met on the trip. This is the guy who had trouble getting up the hill. Um, he's a really interesting guy. He actually um, was in the Navy and then bought a sailboat that was really, really destroyed, I guess, kind of, and then spent about two, was it two years? I think it was two years. About two years and $20,000 restoring this boat and was going to kind of do a sail across the world thing. Turns out he gets seasick, um, so he made, it, he made it to Mexico and then um, sold the boat, um, took, took a really heavy loss on that, and then bought a motorcycle, bought a little he, he harder ridden a motorcycle in his life. So he decides he's going to keep his trip going on his motorcycle. Bought a little 150, which you kind of see for delivering pizzas, um, I guess commonly, and uh, was going strong. He has uh, just a series of bad incidents that happened to him, which is kind of a bummer, but um, he actually just returned. Um, he made it to Peru, and then just kind of decided that he had seen everything he wanted to see. And he ran out of money, too. <laughs> well, <laughs> just saving up money for another trip right now. <coughs> A trip, a trip through South America then, you can, you can see we slowed it down a little bit. We spent a good bit of time in Colombia. I think Colombia was maybe our favorite country out of every place we were. Um, just people are so welcoming. They're not used to seeing Americans because of all the issues they had had, but just a great place. From there we went over into Ecuador, spent some time there. And then in Peru, we're kind of cutting along the coast here. This is mostly desert going really fast. Then we made our jump up into the mountains, up into the Machu Picchu area. And then um, from there, Lake Titicaca in this area, then over into Bolivia. We couldn't get visas into Paraguay. We tried like three times and just got so frustrated, we decided we changed our route and then wound up dropping down here to Iguazu Falls, which is right up in the northern tip of Argentina, and then finished off in, in Buenos Aires. Originally, we were going to probably do more time in Chile and make the crossing because it's winter there. There was a lot of snow in the passes and it just wasn't going to work. So we made the decision to make the crossing up here. We went from 3,000 feet here you know, to roughly um, about 15 to 16,000 is what we were at there. And then we, we stayed high at elevations here. And then it was pretty cool pretty much from that, you know, from the rest of that trip on, that part on there. This is my favorite picture, possibly. It's just so majestic in so many ways. Um, the captain, of course, is in the front. Um, this is actually 
the guy on the bike is a German um, fellow who actually writes for the newspapers there, and I really enjoy him. He's a poet um, as a spoken word artist and makes full-time money doing that. Um, and kind of got on the boat because his grandfather had done something like that, um, and he really felt that he needed to kind of continue that, and it was really cool. This was his first trip, so he didn't really know what was going on. I was by that confused face. Um, so this is how I got the bikes off of the larger boat onto the dock, which was another scary moment, because our trip could have been done in any larger way. So. This is in Cartagena, uh, just a fascinating city. It was really warm when we were there. You know, it's right at sea level. It just, uh, um, just a lot of history and uh, uh, quite, a, quite a few tourists there as well, too. But a good, a good introduction to Colombia. This is, um, I guess, a more typical um, Colombian uh, town that we passed through. We actually kind of cut through the town and then moved right back out of it. Um, but this is kind of just a picture that we enjoyed in a place that we didn't really see coming. And it was just really cool just to go through that area. Colombia is just so green on a motorcycle. It's wonderful because you've got these kind of sweeping curves. And uh, it's just, uh, I, I would go back there and flash. This would be real typical of what our roads look like in Colombia. and. We used to joke that we don't need to go to a zoo because the zoo will be on the road that day. Uh, there, I don't think there was a day of the entire trip that we didn't have some, some parade of animals, you know, going in front of us. And you learn how to kind of read these animals after a while. You know, cows have got their heads down or goats or sheep with their heads down. Usually they're fine because they're busy eating, but it's when they start lifting up and getting kind of frisky, you know, then you, you've got to watch out for them. We, we didn't hit any animals, which is good. We had a couple close encounters with donkeys. You know, one of them almost got me, and then... He doubled back. It was just intent on killing yeah, us. And, and Connor, <laughs> he thought it was fine. The donkey went off, off the road. Connor started going through. Sure enough, the donkey turns around and just, just comes kind of right at it. I've never seen a donkey run before. I never want to again. <laughs> <laughs> so it made it really interesting. There is nothing, nothing boring. Absolutely nothing boring about travel in Central America or South America. The roads here, we, we get bored on them sometimes. We just, there's just not that much happening. Another really nice thing about Colombia, there's no one who can give you a traffic ticket. Um, so we took really good advantage of that and made some amazing time. We would cut probably two hours off of what you could do in a car just by lane splitting and going around. Um, just different things like that. This is in Medellin, Colombia, which for a long time was the most dangerous place. Um, in South America and that we didn't feel in danger at all. We felt completely safe. Um, the city is, in my opinion, completely changed. They introduced a metro cable, um, which kind of connects the more impoverished areas with the more centralized areas. Um, in my opinion, really helped poverty situations there and really um, is starting to really facilitate that place and making it um, just the fantastic center of culture it can be. I would consider living here at some point in time. That's that's how much I really like. He's researching like, universities. It's like maybe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. This is a this is a shot when we were up kind of in the hillside, got off the Metro Cable. A lot of a lot of graffiti work and some really really cool you know, graffiti stuff. This is in Guatape. Um, this is just a really large rock that people have no idea how it got there. Um, it's about 700 steps to the top. So of course we did. Climb that, I guess. I don't know why. Um, this is about 10,000 feet, I'd say, when we're at this elevation. So it was pretty winded, but we were rewarded with Mountain Dew at the top, um, which is his drink of choice. And we didn't see that. It's not a very, um, not very common there. They actually tried to spell Guatapé. There was um, kind of a controversy on who owned the rock. So they started that, and then the town next to them got really mad and they kind of stopped. But we were trying to figure out what that was for about a couple of days and kind of asked somebody. This is a shot from the top of, of, they call it the rock, is really what it's called. Um, this is outside of Salento, um, which is a very kind of just chill spot at this point. There's a lot of Medellin, which is very fast paced and really going. So we came out to this town and did some horseback riding that kind of walked through a village um, and just a lot of green area, which is in the next picture. So we were in cloud forest here. This was, this was a really, really beautiful place. They have certain kind of palm trees that are the tallest palm trees in the world. They're called wax palms. And uh, we're just progressing through there. And uh, at times, the, you know, the clouds would kind of clear out and we'd get this view. And, um, but this is what a lot of Colombia looks like you know, in the countryside. 
I keep wanting to move there now. So it's <laughs> I've got problems with that. It's rough. Mm -hmm. We need to go back. Yeah. But, um, this is just a beautiful church outside of Pasto. Um, right on kind of the Ecuadorian border with Colombia. Yeah. So we, of course, had to, we saw a picture of this. And we're like, All right, so we got to go here. So we um, spent, we, this is where we got lost, kind of getting here. So we spent about two hours trying to figure out where this thing was. Um, and then we actually went down inside of it, and it was absolutely beautiful. It was actually from the altar area, it was cut into the mountain. So it was just really exposed rock and it was generated a lot. This was a couple that we stayed with in, um, in Quito then when we came into Ecuador. Um, uh, Juan Pablo and, and Maria Isabel. Um, they were our hosts, just really fascinating people. Just, uh, Connor played some soccer there, which I was wondering how this is going to go at that kind of elevation. But, uh, he held up pretty well. It's 14,000 feet. I don't know. Um, so it was interesting. This is the highest point that we saw on the trip. This is about 20,000 feet um, is the top of that mountain. This was our getting lost adventure at this day. Um, that road that you see there was one that we were not supposed to take, and we lost about four hours that day. So it happens. It's a good time. And feel free to leave if you need to or write about a lot. We'll kind of shoot through, and then feel free to talk more with us if you'd like to. So stay put or just leave. This is um, this is leaving um, kind of leaving or leaving Ecuador. It's quite pretty typical typical view. And then once we got into um, Peru, it really you could really start to see a lot more poverty. Um, so this is kind of a, a town that we had passed through, which is kind of very typical of the towns that we would see um, for most of Peru. And it was I don't know, it just kind of is what it is. And this is what we kind of encountered for most of um, for excluding the Like I said, the area that we went through along the coast was uh, was basically desert. This is what a lot of it looked like. We took a stop here, and I said, Connor, why don't you go climb that mountain? And he just kind of took off up the mountain. Um, after we ca after he came down from this, he was feeling pretty confident, a bad thing on a motorcycle. He got on the motorcycle. He was leading that day. I was behind him. And uh, he started to actually, he ran off the road. There was a curb, and he was looking around, still feeling pretty proud of himself for climbing this mountain. Oh, kind of hit a whole bunch of sand, and his whole front end, they called it death wobble on the motorcycle. About 55 miles an hour, his whole front end just started going like that. I'm behind him, watching all this stuff, and I'm saying, just hold on, just hold on, just hold on. So he's just trying to muscle it, finally to kind of stabilize it, that, and the bike came back into control. We went up to this point, we went days where we would have sometimes anywhere from one to three pretty close encounters, you know, pretty dangerous type situations. And we said, we've just got to clean this up. We can't have this many close calls or something's going to be bad. And so we just really prayed a lot about kind of safety issues. And then after that, we went a stretch of about a week, you know, without any real major close calls. Yeah. This is actually the same day. This is um, a protest that we came across on the road to Lima. Um, I guess it's very, I had never heard of it, so I didn't really know what was going on, but my dad had read about it and was saying that this is really typical um, if towns really need to get an issue across. I think this protest was more dedicated towards education and health in that city. Um, they felt very um, appreciated by the government. So they kind of shut down the road. They threw a bunch of stones and stuff there, so the road is actually unusable um, to kind of gather um, attention, I guess, to their calls. And this is kind of more exemplified by the next photo. So this is the kind of thing that we needed to drive through. It was, a, it was a little tricky to do. The protests had been going on like three days. We didn't know how much longer it was going to go on. We really didn't want to wait a lot. And um, the, they knew that we were Americans. I mean, it looked pretty obvious from our motorcycles. And a lot of the people kind of helped us figure out how to get around this stuff. So we actually did drive through some of this, some broken glass, and we did go through some flames. But we also went on a bunch of dirt roads around towns, and it took us about four hours to finally figure out a way around all of this. And we were on reserve, and all of the gas stations were closed. They, they literally shut down everything you know, that's going on. Very common in Central America, South America, these kind of protests. All the truckers, there was like a six mile line of truckers on the Pan Am Highway, um, and they just take it in stride. You know, they know this is going to happen, they're not upset. Generally speaking, they're supportive, you know, of the protests that are going on. 
They just recently had one of these in Colombia about a week ago, and it was primarily farmers protesting. They did come to some resolution with the government, and there were some concessions that were made. So these things can be pretty effective, but you never know when you're going to encounter them, and you just have to, you just have to deal with it. So this is right outside of Lima the next day, um, which begins my least favorite three days of the trip. Um, we had about a bottle of water combined over a 24-hour time period. We didn't eat for close to a day, I think. Right outside of Lima, which is really close to sea level, maybe 100 feet or 200 feet from sea level, we got to this point in three hours, which is about 16,000 feet. Um, so we climbed and climbed and climbed. and. When we were on our bikes, we were fine with altitude, and then as soon as we got off, I was trying to find some gloves because the temperature dropped about 60 degrees real, real quickly. Um, as soon as we got off, I almost fell over just due to altitude. Um, but then as soon as I got back on my bike, I was completely fine. And so that was really interesting. We went into a stretch then of back roads to get us from, from that point you know, to, to Machu Picchu. And there's a better road. We didn't. We didn't take the better road, we should have, in a retrospect. But it took us about three days to kind of get from that high point over to Machu Picchu. And um, much of the road we were on involved stream crossings. So we were crossing streams like this. It was primarily one lane, one lane roads. And you didn't quite, it was hard to find gas sometimes. We had a couple stretches where it went 250 miles before we could, could find something. Distances, you're doing really good on this stuff if you can cover 100 miles a day. I mean, that's like a really good day. Most of Central America and South America, you, you plan for like 300 miles a day, but then you know you get this type of thing as well. This is how I was feeling after day one. Um, this is this is called Inca Cola, is what I'm drinking, and it's, it's really good stuff. Um, yeah, pretty much. So. I don't know, this sums up all of my emotions. <laughs> Everything I've ever felt. Um, this is a hostel that we kind of stumble into about 11 o'clock at night. Um, I think it was $3? Yeah. Um, With good reason, too. No, no running water. We no, had um, one white no, hole. Yeah, no toilet. The only water was in big barrels that ran off the roof, and that's what you're supposed to kind of shower in. But there were a lot of big wool blankets, and it was dry. It worked for us. Okay. So the road getting getting to uh, Machu Picchu, where we were, I mean, this guy knows really well this area because we were going to meet his brother there, but he got kind of messed up. But but anyhow, there's there are no road crews on these roads for the most part, and the roads kind of maintain themselves. These these kids were actually filling in potholes in the road, and. Um, they lived in the area, but they had to walk miles and miles to get there. But they would count on people kind of giving them a little bit of money, you know, for helping fill in these these potholes. And the kids they work mostly with their hands. One guy's got a shovel, but for the most part, they go into the side bank and they're grabbing dirt out with their hands and trying to put it in these potholes. There might be somebody that goes on this road every 45 minutes. You know, it's not it's not heavily traveled. And it was I don't know. I've never seen anything quite like this before. The road was terrible, but the views were absolutely awesome. This was the lesser travel road, um, for good reason, but the views were just fantastic. So this is kind of what we were looking at for about three straight days, um, which is kind of the only redeeming part of that little adventure. He actually blew his tire out, um, hitting a sign at night. He has kind of some major problems. So we were out of gas in a town that didn't have any electricity, so we couldn't get gas with a flat tire. And we had toast and peanut butter, and that was a victory for the night. Yeah, that was the high point of our trip. This is Cusco then. Uh, when we came in, they were celebrating uh, Peruvian independence, which doesn't start on the day that there was Peruvian independence. It starts like a whole month ahead of time. So they have all kinds of festivities leading up to it. Uh, if you've ever been to this city, it's uh, kind of loved it. It's, I like it a lot, too. It's just a really cool city. And we made it um, to one of our highlights of the trip, um, something that we were really looking forward to, Machu Picchu. Um, Temperature-wise, it was real interesting. It was like a 30 degree temperature difference from when we woke up to this, which is about 10 o'clock. Um, and we just kind of explored there, tried to read as much as we could, um, be informed on what was going on. Um, it's a whole other adventure to get there. And we were just super fantastic and thrilled about actually getting there and seeing what was going on there. It wasn't disappointing. You know, everybody's seen this picture before in the image, and 
but it, uh, it, it was impressive. We, we, were, we loved being there. We, we had an opportunity to spend the night before we went to Machu Picchu at a place called Olente Tambo, which is probably maybe eight, nine miles from Machu Picchu. And we literally stayed in a ruins. I love this place. This is the view outside of our window. This is a this is a ruins that's there as well too. So you can actually get fairly close to Machu Picchu and kind of save some money. Most people go to Cusco and then take a train. It's about a two hundred sixty dollar train ride. So we got to this other city and then kind of negotiated some cheaper ways of of getting there. So this is kind of what we would uh, see. This is our hostel right outside, and we were packing, getting ready to go, and the kids saw the bike and freaked out and jumped on and was real excited about life. And this is just another way. Um, I guess approving or just showing that bikes really do are just an attack, but uh, attention getter, um, and just really kind of involve the community because they they want to know where we're going, where we've been, all that sort of thing. So it's a really cool chance to get to talk to people. This is going through Peru, and she's making working on making bricks. One of our favorite pictures of the trip, which is actually taken, I guess, and one of my dad's favorite. Um, this was about 17,000 feet in an altiplano, um, and there was actually llama trading that was going on. So kind of to the left of this picture, there was a bunch of guys buying and selling llamas um, that they would use for different products. And then there's a, um, a smaller market right next to it. So she didn't know we were taking this picture, which is why I took that store. This is Lake Titicaca, uh, highest, highest lake of any real significant size you know, in the world. Um, these are called the floating islands. These are made out of reeds that you can see on the ground there. Um, the whole island is actually constructed of these reeds, um, and they just kind of float there. And I guess it's constant work to keep their islands floating. They have to harvest these reeds, um, and then just kind of layer them on as they decompose. They do rely pretty heavily on tourism. They didn't routinely use these boats in day-to-day -day life, but uh, so we had a ride on one of these as well, too. I had heard this was going to be super touristy, and I almost thought about not doing it, but I'm really glad that we did. It was interesting just to hear how the islands were built and kind of what their day-to-day -day life is like and so forth. So it, it, it was worth it. These are our little hobbit poles. That uh, was what we called them. Um, a, a nephew and an uncle actually built is kind of an eco-tourism place. Um, and all of them were super unique. This was kind of the main lodge, I guess. And then we had different smaller places. Um, ours was two stories and really comfortable, I guess. And this is probably the last time we got serious elevation. Yeah. We had dropped down into Bolivia at this point now, so we're out of Peru into Bolivia. So we dropped probably maybe eight or 9,000 feet. This day we dropped like 6,000. 6,000 feet or so, yeah. The country of Bolivia is a pretty tricky country to travel in because if you're an American or if you're a foreigner to buy gas, you need to go to kind of a special gas station that's made for foreigners, and you pay about three times the normal amount that a Bolivian would pay for gas. Those gas stations are really hard to find, so as much as possible, we tried to pretend like we weren't Americans. Our bikes were really dirty, our license plates were covered up, so. A number of times we could pull in and they would actually sell us gas at a, at a pretty reasonable rate. On Saturdays and Sundays, they just don't sell gas. And you know, if you're traveling, it's a pretty big issue. So you'll routinely see people with big jugs of gas along the side of the road. So we would stop there and kind of try to figure out the quality of the gas, negotiate a little bit, and this, this kept us going. But it was pretty nerve-wracking traveling through Bolivia because you're not quite sure where your next you know, gas fill-up is, is going to be coming from. It was maybe one of my least favorite countries for that reason and maybe some others. This is another just look of everything that's going wrong with the world. Um, this is right outside of Argentina. Um, and um, Argentina is a little bit more European and they like to this is the country, yeah. This is, um, the border is actually shut down for a three hour period um, so they could take a nap and lunch break, is what they called it. Um, so we were we were stuck here for about three hours and then we had to, this border, yeah, this border and all took about 12 hours to get through. Um, this is our longest. We had a lot of troubles buying insurance. Um, and then this is one of the places where we used to help her, which didn't go so well. He was not too happy about our price that we paid for him. Um, 
So I was sitting comfortable there for about three hours, just kind of waiting for life to continue on. This was my most nerve-wracking port of crossing. I, we, we got denied getting insurance one time. I thought it wasn't going to happen. So we're trying to figure out, like, how do we get home? And I didn't know if it was going to happen. And finally, we got another, to another insurance place where they would sell us insurance and we could, we could get in the country then. Um, there are gauchos in Argentina. They really do exist, and we saw a lot of them. We ran across, it was like this big gaucho parade one time, and they, um, they had this big extended camping trip thing that they would do. So we, it, was, it was really cool just seeing the horses and kind of the lifestyle. They have wagons that they travel with, and it's just kind of this, this separate community. Um, this is my dad's favorite spot, which is, right, your favorite? I think so, yeah. Ivo Sioux Falls. Um, we spent a day here, um, just kind of working around, taking different pictures. And it was, you could hear the falls for about five miles away. It was just really, really cool. Um, it's like a string of, you know, that's better than like 220? Yeah, it's like 250 different falls. And you can, every every place you walk, you're seeing a different angle on things. It's, I've seen Niagara before, and this to me is just like head and shoulders above what Niagara is like. We met an Irish couple that talked about this being the X or the R-rated version of Niagara Falls. It was like a lot more intense, I guess. So. We did. You can take this boat that takes you down into the falls, and this is called El Diablo right here. This is the biggest of the falls. So we were in this boat, and in the U.S., you know, they have safety, all kinds of safety precautions. That doesn't. None of that applies there. So we're in this. We're in this boat, and there's El Diablo's coming over. You can see where it is. And they keep taking the boat in there closer and closer and closer. And we literally, the front of the boat was like from where I am to where Connor is, is to where the bulk of the water was coming down. And I'm thinking, I, I run a boat quite a bit. I'm thinking, if this guy messes up and that water catches the front end of this boat, we're just like, you know, just going right over. But it was, it was just a spectacular, spectacular place. This is on the very northern end of Argentina. So you can see it from the Brazil side. You can see it from the Paraguay side, and then you can see it from the Argentinian side. Um, the Argentinian side has kind of more more falls you can view, so a lot of people go there. This was our last day of travel. Um, we actually showed this picture to a guy accidentally, and he kind of got freaked out. Um, <laughs> this is our gear. This day was about 15 degrees and raining, um, so I had like eight layers on, I think, that day, and that was still really cold. The day before this, I was really, really bad. We had to stop and I had to warm up and drink a lot of coffee and a lot of things like that. It was just really rough. But yeah, so this is this is the entire of the day. And then we finished up in Buenos Aires and we're almost finished. This is the the entrance to the hospital we stayed at. We did have we did have one thing stolen on the trip. I don't know if you remember that black bag that was on the back end of the of the one bike. Well, I had that bag stolen off from my from my bike. It had my computer in it, uh, my backup jump drive that had gotten wet before, and I had mistakenly put it in with my computer. All my clothes, pretty much everything I owned. Um, Connor had all the papers in a different bag, and he had all the money. We had money hidden different places, so we didn't lose any of that stuff. But uh, I'll still never remember that or forget that door. It was some pros. We weren't robbed. It was snatched and then taken off in a car and then just gone. And it happened within seconds. We never saw it happen. We just we had two bags sitting there. The next minute, we had one bag sitting there, and um, that was only our bad, our bad experience. Right before that, I had commented about how I think I'm going to really like this city. I'm loving this country, <laughs> and it looked it looked like one of the safest places we were. We've gone through all this other stuff, and then boom, and you know, we just lost the whole bag at that point. I still really enjoyed Argentina a lot. I think he's um, still the two. He's kind of been better against it, though. Um, no, I'm not. Yeah, okay. <laughs> this is maybe a street down from where our hostel was. This is kind of the center area. Um, and it really reminded we had been to New York before, and it really reminded me of that, um, I guess, kind of that industrialization, which we actually went through culture shock going into Argentina. It was like a whole different thing. Um, Bolivia was really in poverty and very toned down, I guess. Um, and then this. And then we just kind of freaked out a little bit um, actually coming into this country, which I didn't expect at all. The style of driving a motorcycle was completely different there, too. They actually stay in lanes, you know, stop at stop signs and follow all the rules. And up till then, it, it was a pretty much of a free-for-all, which we loved. We would lane split, so we would drive between cars. There's times I would pass something on the left, Connor would pass it on the right. It, you would do whatever 
worked and was safe. And believe it or not, we felt safer. I still feel safer driving the roads there than I do here because people there are watching. Okay? They, they know you need to pay attention to what's going on. They don't rely so much on the signs and everything else. Here, just drivers are really distracted. I've been rear-ended, almost rear-ended a couple times since I've been back now. I got pushed off the road yesterday. Did you? Yeah, it's good times. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but anyhow, Argentina was much more of a U.S. style of driving. When we came back to the U.S., we, we were, we had a major struggles because we're wanting to do all this stuff we're used to doing. And uh, we just can't do it. It's just not respectful and people don't know that you're going to be doing it. Um, this is after we had uh, packed our bikes up. We kind of upgraded. Um, so this is day one of the upgrade. This is a little um, scooter thing that we broke every rule possible on and brought it on the beach and brought it in the water and kind of tested it out to see what it we did. We didn't bring it in the water. But our motorcycles are getting packed up, you know, to, to send back to the U.S. at this point. And then next day we rode bicycles just to yeah. complete the progression of awesome. <laughs> we jumped over into the road. Better away for a little bit, um, and this was a place that we stayed there. Um, it was actually a kind of an operating horse farm, which was cool. And, uh, yeah. So we were in a quest for the perfect steak um, for most of Argentina and Uruguay. I think we went 10 days straight or something like that, trying to find a, like the best one. Um, this guy was pretty confident that he had it. Um, and you can see a picture of it in the next slide. What were your thoughts? Do you like it? It was. We never hit the perfect steak, you know, so I think we've got to go back. <laughs> it's like chimichurri sauce they have up on the top, and we literally ate steak every single day we were in Argentina. You're in Argentina. Yeah, in Argentina. And it was, it, was, it was really good, but it was never, I think I was too cheap to spend like a, a pile of money. You tried a couple times. You're we, like, this is the time. This yeah, the time. but we never quite hit it. Though. Did you have it for breakfast? We didn't have it for breakfast, no. Probably people do. This was one of the sadder moments of the trip. Um, we packed the bikes um, through through an airplane company and kind of created them, and then they shipped them to we thought was going to be Minnesota. It turned it up um, Newark, New Jersey, and then they loaded them on a truck and then brought them here. And a lot of stuff got damaged. Um, my windshield was cracked, and this has like a bunch of scrapes on it and stuff now, which is all smaller stuff, but it was just kind of sad. So this is. 12,100 miles exactly from where we started, where I said goodbye. It is strangely emotional. <laughs> so that'll, that'll be the end of our trip here. Um, if you're interested in reading more about it, we do have a photo blog, and a number of people here I know followed it. But uh, send me an email if you'd like to read more about it. Anybody here interested in talking more, by Connor Lodge. Okay, I don't have a meal plan, so yeah, I'm serious about this. Buy Connor lunch, and he'd love to talk with you, and I'm happy to talk about it, too. It's, uh, it's really good for us to, to talk about it, kind of unpack this trip. We're, we're still realizing what kind of an impact it had, so this is, all this kind of stuff is really good, really good for us to do. But uh, thanks for coming, and hope you enjoyed it.